Paris. And we are so honored and, and so pleased that you, you are willing to spend some time with us this evening. Um, I think Dottie's still working, but, um, but we could go ahead and start. Um, so uh, how did a Boston girl who um, grew up in Massachusetts, was it, was it Boston or outside of Boston, um, end up in Maryland? That's, that, I think that's been my big question. How did you, how did you land here? Well, those things happen. Again, my thanks to you, Melissa, to Barbara for putting this together. I wanted to do it not only because you asked me, but because Poolsville is a very special part of my life. It, and, um, and so I wanted very much to be able to chat with the Poolsville group. Well, I grew up in Massachusetts, just north of Boston. And so I went to Boston University and at Boston University on Friday the 13th um, in 1950, I had my first date with Tony Morella. The next day on the 14th at the Boston Public Library, he proposed, but it took us four years to get married. <laughs> and uh, I, during the last two years before our marriage in 1954, I worked for TWA, an airline that is no longer existent. And Tony was in the service, fulfilling his responsibilities at Maxwell Air Force Base. And then he went to law school, Georgetown. There you go. That you go. Brought, brought us to the Washington area temporarily, of course. Well, you know, that never happens to be temporary. And so there was the beginning of our lives together uh, in the uh, Washington, D.C. area, which I love, which I absolutely love. So my first job. Uh, well, I must say, I, I had several, I worked for Pan American Airlines, which is also defunct when I got to Washington and was first, uh, first married and then had a child. And then I had an opportunity at this place called Poolsville High School to teach. And so I jumped at the chance. Um, that was 1956 school year, 56 to 57. And so I, I accepted. I lived in, it, in Silver Spring. I taught civics to the ninth grade, something I still think we need to do a lot more with. Um, I then taught the 11th grade English. I was in charge of the school newspaper, which was called The Observer. And I was in charge of the cheerleaders. Now, oh. I, that, that was not unusual that the members of the faculty would be going in like four different directions. And so, but it was a situation that I enjoyed. I learned a great deal. I liked the student body. What, yeah. was, unique, what was unique about that? And then I'll give it back to you, Jackie. Oh, no. What was unique was the fact that this was the year of integration. I came from the North. I had no idea that there would be problems. And the nicest people were protesting. I mean, the youngsters in the elementary school wanted to go to school, but their parents protested, did not want them to go to school in the situation. Uh, in the high school, many of the students themselves were reluctant to attend classes with any of the uh, other black students. So it was a very, very interesting time to try to assuage concerns, to try to teach, to try to develop an atmosphere where education could take place, as well as understanding of differences. Now I'm talking about people that were well educated to the parents, but somehow even looking at the Bible, they said the Bible says there will be a separation, but it, it all worked out. It was a great farm community. Very often I would have a student who might be late for class because he had to milk the cows or might not be able to stay very late in the afternoon because he had to milk the cows. Um, Many of them couldn't spell Swiss chard very well, but they knew how to grow it. And they had a great fair every year. And I remember they gave me a bunny rabbit for my son, a real bunny rabbit. And um, I just, I loved the community. They had what they called, do you remember there was a party line, the telephone? Yes. Yep. So everybody knew what was going on in the community. That party line was a connector. So that was my time at Poolsville. Uh, jumping ahead, and then I'll get back um, to uh, uh, to Tookie. Uh, when I left Congress, the National Institute of Standards and Technology was under my purview in Congress. Wonderful institution. 
and they gave me some awards. But one of them was a graft from the um, uh, the uh, tree, um, the uh, that Newton's tree, an apple tree. And then I said, well, what am I going to do with that? And they said, well, you can plant it any place you want. So I chose Poolsville. And we actually did a planting ceremony in Poolsville. And I am so proud that Poolsville is a magnet school, a school that attracts stars from all over the uh, county, all over the, the region, and is doing so very well. So that's my time at Poolsville. Unforgettable, wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Did you continue um, teaching for MCPS when you uh, went to American University to get your master's? Yes. My next step was I went to uh, Broome Junior High School and I taught ninth grade civics there. And then I, then I uh, went back and got my master's degree at American University, became an adjunct there for two years, and then had an opportunity to go to Montgomery Community College. I am a big believer in community colleges, and I am a big believer of Montgomery uh, Community College. It is affordable, it is accessible, and it is flexible. And that flexibility allows it to look at where the new jobs are, what needs to be done. And I think they've done such a great job. So I'm, I'm very proud of that. And then ultimately I went to American University again. Um, now, I suspect it might have been during that period that you um, kind of became a community activist. What was your what was your first foray? Was it in was it education related? Well, yes, it was in education. I taught for I taught for many years at the community college, and at one point I was appointed to. This was in the uh, uh, early seventies. Boy, you all were hardly alive at that time. But I was appointed to uh, Montgomery County Commission for Women. This was the beginning of commissions for women throughout the country, and uh, so I was honored to to uh, be one of the members of that commission that could look in, in look at inequities and what needed to be done to remediate them. But what was interesting is that during that time in Congress, there was a woman named Martha Griffiths. She was from uh, Michigan. She introduced the Equal Rights Amendment. Hey, that had been introduced many years before. One of the first people to introduce it was actually related to Susan B. Anthony. It was her nephew many years ago who served in Congress, but that's that's the past. But what Martha Griffiths did is she, by virtue of something called a, um, a discharge petition, where you get members of Congress to sign a petition that allows a piece of legislation to transcend a committee and go right to the floor for a vote because it would never have gotten out of the committee. You had a man named Emanuel Seller from New York and he wasn't gonna let an Equal Rights Amendment out of committee. So why do I tell you that? It passed the House, it passed the Senate, it was signed, if you can believe this, by Rich Nixon. And it then had to go to the state legislatures in order to become uh, an amendment to the Constitution. Therefore, as president of the Commission for Women, I lobbied our state legislators to get them to pass this Equal Rights Amendment. And then I realized, you know, if you don't have a seat at the table, you might be on the menu. <laughs> uh, of course, I like, I like Shirley Chisholm's line where she said, um, if you don't have a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. <laughs> and I think, so that was really what my impetus was for running for the House of Delegates, uh, where I served with Jean. Um, and it was the women's movement that put the movement into me. And when you went to um, when you went to Annapolis, um, I think uh, Harry Hughes was our governor, and James Clark Jr. was the president of the Senate, and Casper Taylor Jr. was uh, Speaker of the House. Um, what do you What do you remember most besides the um, the women's issues from those years? Well, you get an you get an A for doing your homework, Turkey. That's so great. Um, yeah, these were all some great men that I that I did serve with. Well, you know, I believe in the state legislatures. I believe state legislatures can be the impetus for things to happen nationally. They're like the proving ground. They have more opportunities, as a matter of fact, in terms of elections and voting 
Um, they are hands-on. So I very much valued. I was on the Appropriations Committee and I remember mm. working with William Donald Schaefer who would come before the committee. He was also, uh, if you remember, he was also the mayor of, of uh, Baltimore and um, he would come before me and Rhodes. I, I do remember at one point, just as an, in a side story with regard to being a woman, our Appropriations Committee also met when um, the legislature was not in session during the summer. And I remember driving into Annapolis and I, I was stopped by a police officer. And um, so I said, he didn't say a word, but I opened the window and, and I just said, oh, officer, I'm sorry if I was exceeding the speed limit um, and there was no other traffic on the road. He didn't say a word. He went to the back of the car and he looked at my plate, which said House of Delegates District 16. And he wrote it all down. Then he came over to me again. He said, can I see your license? I showed him the license. And again, I repeated, I'm sorry, officer. And all he said to me was, he gave, it, he gave me a, the paper back, uh, gave me a piece of paper, which was, you know, my uh, penalty, but it wasn't. It was a warning. It was a warning. I said, thank you, officer. I so appreciate that. And I, I will please watch my speed. Then he said, I didn't do it for you. I did it for your husband, the delegate. Well, oh, pain. <laughs> that was a long time ago. Okay. So I, I go into Annapolis to my appropriations meeting. Honest to God, it happened to be the police commissioner was before appropriations for budget. Oh boy. It was a great opportunity to explain what just had happened. And I said, you know, I hope, sir, that you are doing uh, work with your offices so they recognize, you know, that you have women here who are going to be working on your budget as well as men. He apologized for He didn't know how that would happen. And so um, I, I think it was Marty Ward who said, well, let us make sure that in our minutes of this meeting that we put down that there will be some remediation in terms of the training of our police officers with regard to equity. So I just point that out. So I had, I had a good time for eight years uh, in the state legislature. I'm a big believer in state legislatures and the work they do. Now, were those the years that, um, um, that the mayor of Baltimore was trying to promote the um, Inner Harbor project? Oh, yes. Oh, ab absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you know, William Donald Schaefer and I became very good friends. Um, and later on, when I was in Congress, um, I got involved with domestic violence issues. I was also in the state legislature, but when I went to Congress, this was the Violence Against Women Act. And one of the pieces of legislation that I had had to do with uh, women who were accused of domestic violence, they killed their batterers and not, uh, no evidence, no testimony of the fact that they had battered to the point where there was no, nothing more they could do was allowed to come out in court. So I um, uh, invited him, I, oh, I, I had the legislation and the battered spouse syndrome is what it was called. And um, I got a call from Jessup Penitentiary, Jessup Penitentiary, women wanted me to go and talk to them. These were women who had killed their batterers. And I must say, I was a little apprehensive about doing it. But then I thought, hey, well, you got the legislation, you should go. So I took a staff person with me and we went. They had them at a table, an oval table, and each one told her story. Um, one said, I feel safer in jail than I did at home. Another one had been married to a police officer who went to bed with a gun under his pillow. Uh, and the stories went on that needed to have come out in court, but were not allowed. And so I heard all of that and I thought, well, you know, this is a state matter now. So I called uh, Governor Schaefer, he was governor then. I called Governor Schaefer. And so he arranged, it was like two months later, he arranged to go back to Jessup with me and bring the secretary of, Connection, of corrections, whose name I think was Robinson, with him to hear those same women tell their stories. And I sat there while they went around that table and the women told the same stories. And he said to his correction secretary, 
I would like you to investigate each one of these. They did. Several of the women were um, allowed, uh, um, you know, freedom from um, uh, their penalty or terminate, you know, various things had happened. But I, I always felt that that was a great tribute to a man who, uh, as a leader, opened his ears and his heart and his mind to correcting something that wasn't that he wasn't going to get any great applause for, you know. So I dealt with a lot of issues in that regard to voting issues. Mm -hmm. I think it's I think it's 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 great when people are encouraged to do the right thing and then they do and they do it <laughs> and they do it. Yep, yep. But I would imagine that you were pretty tenacious and um, he wasn't going to be able to say no regardless. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So, um, so now we're, we're um, I think we've moved up to maybe towards the end of the Reagan administration and um, um, Bush and Quayle are getting ready to take over and you are now headed to the House of Representatives um, representing the 8th District. Yeah. Um, so what was that transition like? Well, it reduced my driving time in half. <laughs> <laughs> That is not teasing, but but uh, but that's true, actually. Uh, well, you know, it's interesting because that was a that was an election I was not supposed to win in terms of my party affiliation. I ran against a great guy, Stuart Bainham. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I did when I did win, um, I I had my my uh, campaign not campaign office. My celebration office was at the Wheaton Veteran Center. His was at a hotel in Rockville. And so the press had to rush to mine because they didn't expect they was gonna win, which was kind of fun. But I, I point this out because it was Stuart Bainham and Stuart Bainham came to Wheaton that night to shake my hand to congratulate me. I told that story to others because I think that is an example of somebody who understands politics and understands people, you know, that he would do that. Um, and so, oh yeah, so I spent 16 years in the House of Representatives, a great honor. Eight years, I was a minority in the minority party. And for eight years, I was a minority in the majority party. Uh, so, so you might say I really was an independent, but I represented, I believe that I represented my country, my constituents and my conscience. And I must say, although there may have been people in my own party who were upset with why I voted a certain way or why I did it, I would explain it to them. And I found that if you are open to and respect people, they will in turn come around and respect you. Reminds me of George Washington. He wrote when he was a youngster, he wrote rules of civility and decent behavior. And rule number one was, when in the company of others, act with respect for those who are present. And if people would only do that, we could have differences resolved and come to compromises. And uh, it, it was just a, an atmosphere where much more could be accomplished for the benefit of people. So I, I, I did a lot of work on uh, technology. Remember, I represented the National Institute of, of, of Science and Technology, which used to be, remember, it used to be the Bureau of Standards. I was there when they changed the name. Yeah. Uh, and the National Institutes of Health, the Food and Drug Administration, um, Walter Reed, which was our National Naval Medical Center, and, um, and federal employees. So I worked very hard on all of those issues. And I was on the Space Committee. And I'm glad to see now that we are moving again back into that space realm, uh, mm -hmm. which I think demonstrates um, uh, the, the greatness of, of, uh, of our people. And I did also women's issues and I did international issues. Again, I represented an area that cared about international issues, who believed, as John Dunn said, no man is an island, no country is isolated either. So we do, we do need to work together. These are all some things I wish we would do more of now. Yeah. So did you, you were there from the 101st Congress to I think the 107th. Did you notice a um, 
a change in the level of uh, civility um, during that period? I certainly did. Incidentally, when I was elected, Nancy Pelosi came in a few months after me because she was appointed first and then she was elected. John Lewis was in my class. I had some very prominent people who were um, and who remained, remained good friends. Um, yes, I did. I, I, I did. The first thing I would do when I would introduce legislation is get a Democrat to join with me, get mm -hmm. Democrats. And Democrats would come to me to join on as co-sponsors. I mean, nothing good happens unless it's bipartisan. Mm -hmm. So that was the initial, uh, the, uh, the purpose, the objective is you get someone from the other party to show this is an important issue. And uh, much of my legislation, oh, like all the legislation that I, uh, promoted that passed and became law, uh, all had Democrats working with me um, on the bills as co-sponsors. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I, I think with Clinton, I think I was at the White House more times than most Democrats were for bill signings, you know, family and medical leave and all of mm -hmm. that had occurred. Incidentally, in terms of the, uh, the women's movement, putting the movement in the me, let me remind you that one of the things that was startling was back in the 70s when I decided to run. If I had, if you wanted a credit card, you had to have a mail, a mail sign for you. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. all other things in terms of discrimination with jobs, et cetera. So mm -hmm. I think you know that whole volume of reasons why we needed to, uh, uh, to change things. So I went to, I also, I represented our country in our international conferences. Um, we, um, in the, uh, Brazil, uh, in um, in Egypt on population and development, and in uh, Beijing on the population, the women's conference there too. So I was able to do all of those different things. And quite frankly, I was able to live in one domicile. I didn't have to pack my bag on a Thursday and go back to a district and come back on Monday night or Tuesday, which I think is sad that that happens. I frankly think, that there should be a, a structure where Congress is in session for uh, three weeks uh, out of a month, Monday through Friday, early morning to late Friday, uh, and then have that one week where they're back in their districts. Uh, and then I think you would get more done and you would have more opportunity for members of Congress to know each other. And as Jean and I know, when you become friends and we used to do things together, uh, when you know somebody, you become friendly with them, it's a heck of a lot easier to get your point across legislatively. Build, build those li liaisons and cross that aisle. Yes. Yeah. So then after, um, was, was there anything else that really stood out for you when you were in Congress or should we move on to your next? Uh... Well, I think, you know, I, again, I, a lot of things had happened, like apartheid came down. The, uh, the, the uh, Berlin Wall came down. There were so many incredible things that happened while I was there that I could, I could go through with you in terms of that journey. Um, you even had the impeachment of, of Clinton, if you remember that too. Uh, you had problems with the House Bank. Uh, so we had a lot, of, a lot of things that had happened. But I am, I am proud of the work that I did for the federal employee establishment and all our bureaus and agencies and, uh, and space and uh, the women's issues and the caucuses. I chaired a number of caucuses. And you know, you could, uh, a caucus can occur because you wanna get people together who have constituents who believe in uh, certain things and they want special interest paid to the legislation. So those were done on the side. And so I did a lot of that, but busy schedule, but very, very fruitful. That's great. So then you, after that, you were appointed um, um, by, um, um, now I'm losing it now. Um, you were appointed um, to be the ambassador to the economic um, um, cooperation and development um, in Paris. So were, did you live in Paris those years or, or did you jet back and forth like the uh, people in Congress have to do? No, I didn't. 
there's a domicile that is American owned with full complement of staff, drivers, anything that anybody would want. Now it was wonderful. I lived in Paris for four years. Um, it is the eternal city. My con the people I dealt with um, were the ambassadors to OECD, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. It came about through the Marshall Plan. George Marshall at Harvard after World War II talked about a family of nations and the fact that we should help some of those nations that um, have been uh, destroyed or partially destroyed because of the war. Can you imagine getting that through Congress that you're going to put money into helping countries when you yourself are a country that has uh, had the consequences of a war on your shoulders? But he succeeded. Um, and so it then that's how we got the term Marshall Plan. From the Marshall Plan, which gave money, but didn't tell countries what to do, but rather said, you tell us what you need. Do you need infrastructure? Do you need health? Uh, do you need uh, uh, another area where we can help you. We will give you some, the technology you need and we'll give you some money. But what you need to do what you know needs to be done. Many times people will say, oh, you know what we need in South America? We need a Marshall Plan. What they're talking about is that kind of thing where you oversee, you assist, you mentor, but you don't dictate. And, and the results uh, are far better. I loved it. I loved OECD. Um, you work with the other ambassadors. So what you, oh, it differs from Congress in that Connie Morella couldn't go in there and say, this is what I want to do and, and get everybody else to do it. Because you are, you are doing what your country wants. You are not your individual legislator. And so therefore what I would do is every Monday, I would do a teleconference with the people in, uh, uh, in um, the State Department, whatever departments uh, I was going to be uh, thinking about during the next, the subsequent couple of weeks, what issues are going to come up that would affect them. So we would do a teleconference. I would tell them, you know, Portugal feels this way. And, you know, Ireland also feels strongly about that. We can't let that happen with money laundering or, uh, you know, Spain. So I would, I would bring to them what I had heard about the other countries in terms of legislation or conventions that we wanted to pass. And then we would discuss it. They would tell me what they think. And I might say, I don't know that that's gonna work because of thus and so. But then the US would come up with a position and I would be the one to carry that forth and influence my other ambassadors. So, I get to the point where you get to know your ambassadors and you get to know their families. So again, like I think Congress should do and like Jean and I did in the state legislature, if you know them, you can get a heck of a lot more done. They will, under they will understand you and uh, um, you can understand where they're coming from and, uh, and you can work out solutions. So, and also, OECD worked by consensus. Can you imagine? With the exception, to just a couple of areas where you didn't have to have total consensus, but worked by consensus. So you had to convince everybody about the conventions. And they did a great deal on energy, nuclear energy, great deal on money laundering, uh, and many other all the areas too. So it was a it was a great opportunity to serve our country in a place like Paris. Oh, that, it sounds, <laughs> you know, it, it sounds wonderful, but you it, could, it, uh, it, no it, one could have I, done it better. <laughs> I know, I, my last campaign, which I lost, um, that was in 2002. Um, it, was, it was redistricting that had occurred, you know, that mm -hmm. it put you know, Prince George's County into Montgomery County and took some of Montgomery County and put it into the, the sixth district. Well. Paris Glendening was the uh, governor. And of course the governors have something to do with redistricting too. So I would say to people who would say, oh, oh I'm so sorry, you know, that they did this to, to you with redistricting. I'd say, well, you know, please remember, I went from Paris Glendening to Paris, France. Ah. 
who won that one? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that's a that's a great one you have such you have such great lines i'm going to ask you about another line that you have now you said that you are not retired you are rewired yeah. and i love that i wish i had you know six years ago i wish i had uh, coined that phrase when i retired um so um you want to share with us uh what what your passions are now well you know actually from from being at OECD, I had a chance to, to do a little bit at Harvard as a visiting fellow. And then I was appointed uh, actually by Obama, President Obama, to the American Battle Monuments Commission. That, that is in charge of our American cemeteries overseas. And that, that I found that to be very moving. And the reason I asked for it, the reason I asked for it was because I had spoken when I was in Paris, they would ask me, as the ambassador to speak at the various cemeteries, you know, and I would do that. And I realized, my God, you know, here we have people who have, whose lives have been given for someone else's freedom and opportunity. And they were so beautiful and so moving that I thought I, I would like to be on this commission. And so I was very honored to, and now we've got Memorial Day coming up, but I'm mm -hmm. very honored to, uh, to serve there. So, so what am I doing on? Well, unfortunately, you get so involved with organizations. I'm still on the board of the Women's Congressional Policy Institute. That is the women members of Congress, Democrats as well as Republicans working together. I'm, I'm on the General Accountability Board, um, is an advisory board, the GAO. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I'm president of the Washington Institute of Foreign Affairs. I don't have to do much with that though, because it's a bunch of old ambassadors <laughs> who like to talk about current issues and mull it over. So that's that's an easy thing. And I do I do a lot of, of zooming. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I so I, I do stay involved because I'm a political junkie. Mm -hmm. So I feel that having served and, and valued my the opportunity to serve that I have a responsibility to do what I can to enhance um, the situation and particularly Congress and government. That's why I think we need to do more with civics education. Yeah. Do more. If you want to know something about who holds office or what the issue is that, of the moment, ask somebody who wants to become a citizen because they're the ones who've done the studying. They're the ones who know who holds what office and whatever. Yeah. And I think we need to do much more of that. That's true. That's true. Um, well, that is all the questions I have for you, but I know our audience probably has a thousand questions. So Melissa, do you want to um, take it over? Dottie, do you want to unpin us? Um, sure. So if anybody has a question, you can unmute now and ask Connie directly, or if you want to put it in the chat, I'm happy to read it. Um, Connie, I'm going to start off because hearing this amazing history that you have, and I didn't know a lot about it, so I just find it um, so fascinating. First of all, I want to thank you for fighting for equality for women, but for so many other people that have not felt it in this nation where we're all supposed to be equal. So I really, really appreciate that you just really had a passion for that. So I wanna know as a little girl, did you always think about political office? I mean, a lot of little girls think about teaching, which is what you did, but where did you transition into that political arena and, and public service? You know, it's, it's, that's an interesting question that you ask. Uh, Melissa, because I've thought back, and no, I never thought about running for Congress or the state legislature. However, however, I was an officer in my junior high school, and I was an officer in high school, and I was an officer at Boston University. And uh, in fact, that's kind of how I met my husband, Tony, because I was soliciting, no, bad word to use. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to get votes you know, to be secretary of my class at Boston University, uh, a woman wasn't president, it was always a guy, but to be mm -hmm. secretary. And I remember, you know, asking him and the group of guys that he was with, and that's how he got to know me. 
and he said, you know, I always wanted to, you know, to date you and whatever. And, and that's how I met you. So yeah. So I, I think, I think what that said was that I guess I, I liked people so much that I wanted to have the chance to represent them. And um, that must have been why. Yeah. So maybe, maybe there's kind of a linkage, but I hadn't really thought much about it until I thought back and I thought, yeah, you know, you did run for office, so you did win. And, and, yeah. Right. right. So I, so I encourage young women, particularly, you know, try for one of those, uh, one of those committees or one of those offices. Get involved. Get involved. When you get involved, you find out where there are needs. And you may fit into those needs. I mean, like Barbara Mikulski, she she never held office before she ran for the federal Congress. And but it was a road situation that made her get involved in an issue and made her then decide to run for office. So I I um, I push the concept of commitment, involvement. You'll then find out where the problems are. You'll find out where the successes and good things are, and you can make a difference. Are there any other questions or comments that people want to talk with Connie about? Go I, right ahead. I'm sure you guys have some questions. Hi, Connie. Conseil Song, I don't know if you remember me. I am, my, uh, my late husband was John Briscoe. And he worked for the World Bank. He was the senior advisor, water advisor. And we were with you in Lanai for the retreat of the senators and the Congress people. And he was one of the experts speaking there. And you, I loved meeting you and all the others, but you were really special. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to go with me every place I go. <laughs> Uh, oh, good. I also taught at Harvard, so we are fine. <laughs> yeah, nice seeing you. Thank you. Wonderful. I learned so much about you. And I am so happy that you are also involved. You are involved in women issues. Yes, yes I am in very involved too. Thank you. And some of them, you know, some of them are situations I, I can't resist when they say, will you do something with these young women in high school or starting college, uh, <laughs> getting them more involved? Because they're our leaders. I mean, you know, I yeah. say I'm not really around that much. Well, I hope we'll be around for a while, but, uh, but I'm looking to the future. So we need to train our women. And you're finding more and more women now who are gaining the kind of confidence in themselves to be able to, uh, to run for office. You know. Yes, we open this for them, our fight in the 60s and 70s. Yeah, right. I have daughters, three, and they are they have a lot of confidence. They, right. they have some good, you know, prop professions and all is well. <laughs> and, and when you begin to look around at some of our major corporations and companies, you suddenly begin to see women now coming into the league. Mm -hmm. When yeah. I get, uh, you know, if there's a statement that comes from some stock I have, I always look at the board of directors to make sure they have women. And if they don't, <laughs> I, I call them, <laughs> you know, the emergency line or whatever. And then, oh, oh. But the next time they put women on. That's very good, thank you. You know, it, it really is sort of sad that Actually, I am, I am the only woman now uh, who has gone from the state legislature to the federal Congress in Maryland. Do you believe that? Wow. And then I no. thought to myself, why? Well, I think it's because after they've done their work in the state legislation, we've got some great women who are serving right now in our Maryland legislature. Then they reach the point where they think about running for Congress, and then they see all these guys going to run for it. And then very often they find that that the guys are the ones who are going to get the clout in the primary, you know, the support. And so either they drop out or they don't make it through the primary. And so I think this says that our work is not over. Incidentally, my friends, 
we have two U.S. senators, and we have eight members of the House. No women. No women. Wow. From Maryland. From Maryland. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. okay. So, just a point of thought. Well, I'm glad you're not going to stop advocating for women, because there's still a lot of work to be done. That's so true. That's so true. Um, you know, I also, when I look at the Congress now, and there's some really good people who are serving, but I think the major problem they're facing, and you know it as well as I, is polarization. Mm -hmm. I grieve, I, I grieve that you have two sides that will not come together, that you have actually leadership on both sides kind of saying to their members, don't go over there and get on that legislation. Don't go over there and get on that legislation. Uh, I just think that we as the public have got to do all that we can to see that they are working with the other side. Because that's how you're going to get the very best um, results. So so, Connie, do you think that the political system is obsolete now because of that? Do you I, think that we should change the the way we elect people? Do you think that, um, you know, do you think the party system has outlived its use? Well, I just don't see how you're going to turn it around that quickly. I, I think, you know, like you've got, for instance, there are some good things happening. You have a, you have in Congress with its many caucuses, you have a problem solvers caucus. I mean, it truly does have like, I don't know, it's eight members of, who are Republicans, eight members who are Democrats. They try to work things out. And then you have some other groups that are also in, a, in their own way, but you've got two extremes. I think the difference can be we, we are the voters. We make the difference. We let them know what we want. But I, I have to tell you, uh, Toki, I think this polarization has been seeping into the public. I, I mean, I'm finding more and more people say, my side is the right side. My mm -hmm. side is the right side. So forget it. I'm not even gonna associate with you or we're not even gonna talk about this anymore. And I think that's something that we as a wonderful society have got to do something about, to be more tolerant of each other, to create opportunities where we listen we learn and we lead. Mm -hmm. There's there. I mean, there are a lot of families that um, you know politics are not allowed at the dinner table because you know within families there's that polarization. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. It, it's uh, I don't know. It just feels different than it did when I was young. Oh yes, and of course you know, and I and I must say, let's say for the House of Representatives, it's only a two year term. So, that's crazy yeah they're there it is that, that they're, they're elected and then all of a sudden you find out who's going to run against them okay. raising money i'm on another group called issue one by it's a um, bicameral group a bipartisan group i should say former members of congress i guess because they don't have to raise it anymore but they know what it's like the hazards of raising money looking at what can be done, whether in lobbying, in terms of um, um, campaign finance reform, issues that can be done on a state level, what needs to be done federally, um, and, uh, and looking at election integrity too, another facet of what they do. So you've got some groups out there. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, yeah, but again, when, with the two year term, they don't have any time to breathe. Yeah. They're losing money mm -hmm. and they're trying to offset negative campaigning, negative campaigning. You know? mm -hmm. Sometimes yeah. it's not the member that's responsible. It's like they put it in the hands of, of a group to start coming up with nasty things about people. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, I went the other day to um, a, uh, a new museum called Planet Word, W-O-R-D, it's brand new. And so I was anxious as a former English teacher I was anxious to say, what, how, how does it work? Actually, it was founded by a woman who was a teacher who's married to Tom Friedman. You know Tom Friedman? His wife, yeah. Um, but to me, the concept of word is so important because the word can ignite nastiness. The word 
can salivate and it can calm uh, and, and bring about results. The dynamism of the world, and, and I must say, I think Trump was a real disabler of the positive facets that could come from wars. I mean, when you start calling names or whatever, whoever does it, you know, who just is an example. Um, I think that people then begin to accept that and they react that way. So, yeah. so you can see how I feel. <laughs> Yeah. Yep. No. Nope. So do you want to, do you um, have any more um, stories about Poolsville High School? Um, your years there? How, how many years were you there? Two? One year. One year. Just one. And then they wanted me to teach French. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would have come use, you know, that would be useful later in life, right? No, they were prophetic. <laughs> they were prophetic. Now the opposite Absolutely. became a doom, which was closer. But I, I had a I had a great year there. I learned a great deal, um, a great deal about farming. I learned a great deal about people caring for other people. Um, I learned, uh, as I mentioned, the party line. I learned how they were so knowledgeable about everything. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, and I learned, you know, one of the things that brought both um, um, races together was sports. We had a guy, Howard Lyles, I'll never forget, mm -hmm. because he was a great athlete. That could bring people together. So, mm -hmm. um, but there were very few blacks that were there, and uh, it was very traumatic for them. It was traumatic for their families too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I imagine the parents were concerned. Were I'm sorry. The, I imagine the parents uh, were concerned. Oh well, I remember another young woman. Her name old now, Lorraine Naylor, uh, her mother wrote me a note, said, please, Mrs. Miller, don't get yourself into any trouble trying to help Lorraine. And I was just being nice to her and trying to, you know, another another young woman whose father was a, was a minister, was not allowed in the, um, oh, I had the drama department too, was not allowed, oh, the journalism, was not allowed <clears throat> there because there was a, a black that was there. And so I just said, well, nobody knows. You just come and, uh, you know, don't make any announcement about who's in the class with you, but, uh, you know, everything will work out well. And it did. And, and mm -hmm. these, were, these were good people. These were mm -hmm. good people. Um, and they just wanted what was best for their community and for their own families. And so it worked out well. That's why I think Poolsville was such a great school, a great school. And oh, I have a in final oh, thing, there is something that I think you know about, maybe. The museum, M-O-O-S-E-U-M, is in Boyd's, and I've spoken there uh, because I, I think it's a wonderful tribute to the rural community and the community, the dairy community of Poolsville, mm -hmm. the museum. Yep, yep. Melissa, did you see another question? Um, yeah, I have a few questions from the chat. So the first one is, were you ever involved with Girl Scouts? Uh, yes, I was. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I've gotten an award from them. I think the Girl Scouts uh, gave women opportunities that the men, that the men had. Yeah. Mm hmm Actually, it's interesting because I was not that involved as I was growing up. It was more later on that I became very much involved in, and in a leadership capacity. But I, yeah, I think we need places like that. Yeah, where women have an opportunity to be themselves, to expand, mm -hmm. to grow. You know, it's interesting. You, you pose that question. If you don't have, you know, like the Boy Scouts have women now, they're having a difficult time trying to figure that out. And um, I don't know where it's going to go, but I think the concept of scouting is, is a good thing for males and certainly for females. Agreed. Um, the next question is, should we have term limits? Uh, <clears throat> <laughs> That's a heated. <laughs> no, you know, you know what the term limit is? The term limit is when you vote. We are, we are voting a term limit every time we vote. We are limiting somebody uh, if we want to, or else we're letting them carry on. No, what I think is you need to have uh, the House of Representatives needs to be four years, 
and obviously it doesn't happen because the Senate has six years and they could reach a point where you've got somebody in the House running for the Senate against a senator, you know, it, 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 the conflict of the six year versus the four year. I think we need that. But in terms of uh, the term limits, I just think if we give people more information that they can limit it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I couldn't be on here tonight and not, not recognize you for, as somebody who was a, a role model and a mentor not only for a lot of women who are now serving in government offices or in legislative bodies or councils, but there were a lot of men who took lessons from you that you probably weren't even aware of. And I happen to have been one of them because you, you were in your second term in Annapolis when I first started. And I looked around and said, who here is doing it the right way. <laughs> and I want to try to learn from that individual. But, and, and the other thing I just mentioned for the others, Connie's the only politician I can think of in Montgomery County that was such an institution. She only needed to put one word on her lawn signs. It was Connie. <laughs> you, she didn't need to say what she was running for. She didn't need to put Morella on it. It was Connie. And everybody knew who that was. Oh, Jean, thank you very much. You're you have been wonderful. And, and somebody that we've all been proud of to say you were our representative. Thank you, thank you. And it's thank, so thank you, Jean. That was, that was great and that's so true. Um, Let's see, I have another question in the chat. Your many successes are inspiring. If you find yourself with a local issue that you're trying to find an ally and you feel you've hit a brick wall at the county level, how would you suggest that the person or group proceed forward? And is something on a local level? I, well, I think if you have yeah, a local uh, issue. You have a local issue. You're, you're not the only one who has it. There are not. I mean, if if you're the only one who has it, call a member of the of the federal federal legislature, even though it's a local one, and they'll try to help you or call your own representative. But I find that very often, if you have an issue, you're not the only one who has that issue, whether it has to do with uh, um, the um, um, street repair, road signs. Um, something that's being done that shouldn't be, whether a park should be or whatever, whether it's education, but you usually can find somebody else who cares also. And therein you can build a little coalition of people who, who agree with you. The more people you have, the more effective you're going to be. And so members of, of the legislature will listen to an individual most of the time. But if you have a gathering of more than one, then I think they definitely will. And then you could align with various groups. I just believe in, um, I believe in the multiplication, you know, effect, um, that reaching out to others who may feel the same way. And look to the organizations that already exist and see if they can help. I could give you a better answer if I knew what the particular problem is in terms of where one could go. But, but don't be lethargic. Yeah, it's coming through the chat. So that's as specific as I know from the person that sent it. Um, okay, so they just send specifically transportation. Yeah, yeah. So that has uh, become an issue for Poolsville residents. I know just from talking to people. Um, so that that's... So you see automatically, you have, you have the beginning of a group. There may already be one that feels the same way. Uh, and so I would say reach out, try people, you call people who may just be neighbors. You may not even know them very well and just say, I just wanted to share with you and find out you know, if you have a strong feeling about something in our community 
and they may say absolutely not to so forget them go to someone else <laughs> right right so i i would say uh, your voice is important too so that person should recognize go to who your leaders are in pools there um if you have to go to the county transportation do that but what i'm saying is along the road to trying to achieve something it is very helpful to also see if you can pull in followers chances are you can okay do we have more questions for connie anybody want to just say hi to her any I'd old like friends i'd like to i'd like to ask you connie you worked with and for a lot of incredible, powerful, influential people. Were there one or two that really inspired you, uh, fostered your growth professionally and personally? Mm, a lot, a, a lot. And I, I, I think that's why we shouldn't underestimate ourselves and know that we may be impressing other people to do something. Yes, uh, it, it's again, that glass ceiling uh, if you can see, even if you don't know the person, if they have broken through that glass ceiling and they have been able to achieve something, you see that this is somebody in heels who's doing that. It's not a guy. And so that opens the door, I think, for all of us. I think that's, that's important. Oh, I had, um, I'll tell you about a family. I mean, you may not, you may not think it's the best example. And I could give you a lot of examples of women who have been mentors to me uh, and, and I very much value it, men who've been mentors. But you know, that Bush family, George H.W. Bush and George W. Bush, I have not agreed with them on a lot of issues, but they are a sterling family in terms of values. I met Mrs. Mrs. H.W. Bush, who's now in post everlasting with my husband, um, when she was the wife of the vice president and she came into Montgomery County and somehow um, somebody was jumping on me for some issues. So she helped me run for re-election to the state legislature by doing an event for me. And I think it was because she thought this would be a nice thing to do this woman, you know, has this problem with somebody who was angry at something. Um, and then uh, her husband, H.W., is just a, a darn nice, guy, whether you agree with him or not. And then George W. Bush, my, I, it was, I think my last campaign, I was having not difficulty, but I needed to raise more money. And so my, um, my, not my staff, but my volunteer workers on my campaign said, you know, the president would be willing to come in and do a fundraiser for you. And I thought, oh my, Montgomery County, you can't have a Republican they will put my head on, on, on his head, you know, and say, see, look at how right wing she is. And then I, a month or so later, I thought, I thought, you know, I really could use the money. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay, we'll do it. Well, my family showed up, my supporters showed up, we had big turnout and president, and the press were there, of course, in the front row. And he said, you know, this is a really hard working woman. And uh, she votes with me when she thinks I'm right. And she votes against me when she thinks I'm not. And she's doing more of the latter. And then later he said, you know, she teaches English. Uh, and there are those who think I should take English lessons from her. My point is, he knew his audience. He knew my situation. And it worked out beautifully. Now, that's something we all need to do to know our, and respect people and know, know their situations and then we can help them. So mm -hmm. as I say, you've got, um, and then I get appointed as ambassador, never gave them any money, never did any, you know, and it's something very special about some people that regardless of their politics on each and every issue are just superlative. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't mean to carry on like that. But oh I, no, thank you. <laughs> I just think the Bush family are very, uh, have been very special in their value system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Connie. Okay, before we let Connie go, I just want to check to see if there's any more comments or questions. Okay, well. Hey, I, um, hey, I give you one final point. Sure. 
because we are we are here and in, in proud of our state of Maryland, you know, the Naval Academy is now the first building named for a woman. Oh. And it is the Hopper Building. It is named for Admiral Grace Hopper. She was an admiral and she was also a great uh, computer technology person. She uh, advanced cobalt. And I actually was the chair of the House of Representatives Y2K committee, oh, wow. <laughs> which is when she came into the offing, you know, as the person in charge of cobalt. Incidentally, of Y2K, what it did do is it, uh, it brought government and, and uh, the private uh, sector together. And uh, also it got a lot of entities like the District of Columbia to come up with new computer systems. But I am so pleased that on that campus at Annapolis, we have the Hopper Building named for Admiral Grace Hopper. Go Thank Navy. You. You've been a great group. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Well, I'd like to thank uh, Tookie for um, monitoring and interviewing and having great questions. And Connie, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. It was a fabulous presentation. I'm sure that we all learned more about you than, than what we I, I know. Oh dear. Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting. I feel like we could go on with, with more questions, you know, more intimate. But, you know, Grace, Grace Hopper also said, a ship in port is safe, but that's not what ships are for. Sail on. So I would say, sail on. Sail on. Yeah. So I, yeah, I hope this has encouraged people just to, to reach out, you know, to younger people to get involved, for us to stay involved, which I know a lot of us are. Um, so I think that's great. And if you guys enjoyed this program, um, you know, we want to thank all of our sponsors that help us, our individual donors that help us keep our programming and the Poolsville Senior Center going. We appreciate all of that. And if you enjoyed this, make sure you look at our website, um, see what else is coming up. Next week, we have Paul uh, Kreingold with the lost history of the Potomac Marble, mm -hmm. which should be interesting. Um, and then the week after, we have Marianne Jung, who does History Alive presentation. It will all be on Zoom. Hers happens to be on a Wednesday afternoon for those of you are, that are home or even have teenagers at home because she's going to do um, an imperson she impersonates historical figures and she's going to be doing Amelia Earhart. So speaking of great women, here mm -hmm. we go. So if you're available, you know, look on our website for that and come join us on that. If anybody's watching on Facebook Live and they can hear me, if you like and make a comment on that, we would really appreciate that. And everybody can unmute, say our thank yous to Connie, say goodbye. Connie, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank thank you. Thanks so very much. Thank you, thank you Connie. Thank so much. You. Good job. And thanks, everyone, for thank joining you. us tonight. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks, Connie, it's thanks, been, Connie, it's been great. It's been so great to touch base again. And thanks so much for coming out tonight. I considered my proposal and approved it.